I'm quite happy to introduce and welcome our first speaker, Hashim Hashim. He is the Professor of Urology and Director of Eurodynamics in the world-renowned Bristol Urology Institute. Yes, Hashim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ananda, and uh, thank you for the invite and the kind introduction. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And it would be nice if we can see each other and meet each other in person. But um, this is the world we live in at the moment with uh, COVID. And it seems that um, we are having more meetings now, which is good. Uh, but it would be nice to have it more uh, in person rather than in uh, virtual. I've actually just um, in the middle of uh, doing a Eurodynamics course with Spain, uh, where we're giving lectures as well. Um, so I will start with this. Um, so I'll be talking to you about uh, the evaluation of male LUTs. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. Yes, uh, Excellent. So I think the first thing uh, to talk about when we're talking about uh, male LUTs is to uh, talk about the classification of male LUTs. Um, and this uh, is divided into storage, uh, voiding, and post-micturition symptoms, where the storage are mainly the urgency, the frequency, the nocturia. The voiding is the slow stream hesitancy and so on, and then post-micturition. But it's also important when evaluating uh, men with lower urinary tract symptoms, uh, we don't forget the function of the erectile tissue, uh, and that has to be inquired and assessed as well. So um, I'm also going to start off with uh, talking about how the terminology changed really over time. And um, you can see that the EAU guidelines started off with benign prostatic hyperplasia, but over time, this has actually uh, gone and we now call it male lower urinary tract symptoms, including benign prostatic obstruction in the non-neurogenic patient. And uh, in 2021, uh, this hasn't really changed. It's still male LUTs, uh, including BPO. And that is important because BPH really is a histological diagnosis. And unless everyone has a biopsy of the prostate, uh, we should really be calling it uh, BPE, which is benign prostatic enlargement. Um, and if it's causing obstruction, then it's called uh, benign prostatic obstruction. And um, it, the, it's the general term for the prostate causing obstruction. Uh, but if you have outlet obstruction, for example, for strictures, then it's called bladder outlet obstruction. Uh, and this is now the accepted terminology, both in the um, AUA guidelines and in the European guidelines. So what causes male LUTs? Well, the reason we moved away from uh, prostate uh, and prostatism is because uh, patients don't complain of that. They complain of lower urinary tract symptoms. They could be related to the bladder. Um, they could be related to the prostate uh, and could be related to many other things um, uh, that can cause symptoms uh, in the bladder, which we talked about uh, at the beginning. Um, so what do we need to do to assess these patients? Well, um, medical history is important. Um, if you don't speak to patients, then you won't be able to um, assess them. So this is based on clinical principles. Um, symptom questionnaires as well um, are important uh, to be used in um, assessing these patients. And the commonest symptom questionnaire used is the IPSS. Um, however, again, this is more uh, uh, looking at prostate uh, rather than uh, assessing things like incontinence and post-micturition symptoms. Um, so the recommended one is the International Consultation on Incontinence Questionnaire for Male Lower Urinary Tract Symptoms, which looks at incontinence and symptom bother for each of these symptoms. Um, there's also the Danish uh, Prostate Symptom Score, which is um, which has a symptom bother on uh, on the individual items, but uh, is mainly used in uh, Denmark. So why are we saying the ICIQ MLATS? Well, um, this is a publication comparing the ICIQ with the 
IPSS, and basically the conclusion was that um, the ICIQ measures all lower urinary tract symptoms, which is what we are assessing. Um, so when even when you operate on the prostate, uh, patients will suffer and have um, other symptoms and not just uh, voiding symptoms. And therefore, it's important to assess the whole uh, lower urinary tract. Um, when assessing these patients, a bladder diary for three days, a validated one, is, um, is needed. Um, and that is based on strong recommendation from the European uh, guidelines. And the ICIQ, again, is the, is the only validated uh, bladder diary in the world. Um, this is a three-day bladder diary where patients record their amount of fluid they drink, the type of fluid, how much they void, and bladder sensation. Um, rectal examination, again, that is recommended um, uh, in the guidelines. Um, so feeling the prostate uh, does help you uh, assess uh, the size of the prostate um, and also the texture of the prostate. Um, and what I tend to do usually when assessing the prostate is, uh, you know, the width of your finger, you know, the length of your index finger, um, and therefore you can uh, briefly assess the uh, size of the prostate based on the um, uh, area that you feel. Urinalysis, again, is a cheap, easy uh, way to assess uh, problems looking at uh, different parameters on the dipstick, again, is recommended by uh, the guidelines. Prostate specific antigen, this is probably more uh, uh, related to wherever you are in the world and healthcare system. Uh, but in general, uh, most guidelines um, around the world recommend uh, doing a PSA test uh, to look at, um, well, you can use it for progression of uh, uh, disease in terms of benign prostate, but also to assess for um, cancer, but patients need to be counseled um, about uh, having the test. Renal function test in general, there's not much evidence about doing renal function tests, um, blood tests basically, uh, but the uh, recommendation from the European Association is that there is a strong uh, recommendation, especially in those who have other comorbidities such as diabetes. Post void residual, I don't agree with this recommendation. They say that there's a weak uh, recommendation to measure post void residual. However, um, later we'll talk about the American guidelines which recommend using uh, doing a post void residual. And actually, it's part of doing a flow test. So um, I would say that a flow test and a post void residual are. Uh, important in assessing male lower urinary tract symptoms um, to uh, look at the uh, voiding pattern of the patient. So if we look at this patient who um, came to have um, a flow test, um, the important parameters include a maximum flow rate, the voided volume, the residual, but also the shape of the curve. And uh, this shape of curve is suggestive um, rather than diagnostic of uh, benign prostatic obstruction. You can see here that the, it's going up and then coming down with a very long tail. And this is usually suggestive of um, bladder outlet obstruction, but not diagnostic. Um, so the only way to diagnose bladder outlet obstruction is uh, to do invasive urodynamics. Um, and again, the uh, guidelines uh, published uh, in 2021 have not been really updated uh, because it says that there are no RCTs, randomized control trials, to look at um, uh, bladder outlet obstruction or the use of urodynamics in bladder outlet obstruction, um, which is not true because um, this publication came out uh, last year, at the end of last year, looking at um, the uh, upstream trial, uh, which was led from Bristol, uh, comparing the use of urodynamics in men with lower urinary tract symptoms. Um, and there, the conclusion from that is that there is a role, um, but it has to be, we have to find what that role is uh, in terms of diagnosing bladder outlet obstruction uh, in men. Um, this criteria would have to be modified um, and assessed uh, in the future.
Uh, what is not recommended um, is ultrasound scan of the upper tract. And again, um, if you, patients don't have a residual then um, and they have normal blood tests, renal blood tests, then there is no need to assess the upper tracts in men. And that is why the recommendation is you don't need to do upper tract imaging. Um, the same thing with imaging of the prostate. Um, you only need to do imaging of the prostate uh, if you are considering surgical treatment because they'll give you much better assessment of, on size of the prostate um, when um, you're considering the different surgical options, which you will hear about um, later on uh, throughout the next two hours. Uh, similarly, voiding cystourethrogram is not indicated. Uh, and if you're doing video urodynamics, uh, then you would get a cystogram anyway. Uh, but in general, you don't need to do a cystogram as a baseline investigation. Uh, and similarly with cystoscopy, if the flow test looks uh, normal um, in terms of shape and also um, uh, pattern and flow, then you don't need to do cystoscopy. Uh, but obviously, if there are red flag symptoms such as hematuria, or suggestive of a urethral stricture or bladder cancer, then you may want to consider cystoscopy. Again, the recommendation is not to do it uh, in uh, standard index patients with lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, and similarly for other non-invasive tests, uh, they should not be offered uh, as alternatives to pressure flow studies uh, if you want to do your dynamics and a confirmed bladder outlet obstruction. So in terms of uh, algorithms, uh, as you can see, the main basic uh, investigations that need to be done for men with LUTs is a history and examination, a symptom score, a physical examination, and urinalysis. Uh, PSA, chain, uh, PSA can be uh, done and measurement of post-void residual. Um, if the symptoms are bothers not bothersome, then you don't need to do anything. If they are bothersome, then uh, you would go on to further assessment with a bladder diary, a, an ultrasound assessment of the size of the prostate and urophilometry. Um, if they have a significant post-void residual, then you may want to consider an ultrasound scan of the renal tract. Um, treatment is then planned uh, with um, accordingly and uh, medical treatment can be initiated. If you want to go ahead with surgical treatment, then you may want to consider pressure flow studies. If they have abnormal rectal examination uh, or suspicion of any other red flag symptoms, then you would need to treat uh, or assess according to standard guidelines. So you can almost have a one-stop uh, male LUTs clinic where you would uh, assess all the uh, do the, all the baseline investigations and start uh, medical and then uh, potentially surgical therapy for, uh, for men with uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. So in conclusion, I just say that um, I'll also mention the American Association guidelines and uh, these have been uh, updated uh, recently, but you can see here that uh, the American guidelines um, agree with the European guidelines and most of the other international guidelines where patients have to start with a history examination and uh, a symptom score and a urinalysis based on clinical principles. Uh, assessing the size of the prostate again is important and measurement of post void residual um, and uh, flowmetry is important. So all these are based on clinical principles. Um, pressure flow studies should be done prior to surgical intervention if they change, if they may change the diagnosis or the uh, management based on expert opinion and uh, and patient and basically also that patient um, clinicians should inform patients of the possibility of treatment failure uh, and the additional need of further surgery and what is uh, now being uh, discussed further are patient decision aids um, for uh, patients coming in for um, surgical options following uh, assessment uh, and treatment. So I hope this is a, uh, a quick uh, summary. Uh, it's always difficult in 10 minutes to go into detail with these um, baseline investigations, but um, I hope that it gives you an idea about how 
uh, to assess these patients with male lower uh, urinary tract symptoms. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ashim. That's a very comprehensive talk and um, that forms a kind of a strong platform for our rest of the session. Thank you very much.